Good morning and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series. Today's webinar is New Landscape Pests with Dr. D Adam Dale. Uh, he will provide a brief overview of um, biology and identification of key pests, insect pests, review the recent and emerging key insect pest management strategies. This webinar is approved for one FNGLA, Florida Water Star, LIAF, DVPR, LA, and FDA, FDAX uh, CEU. There is a $10 administration fee to receive a certificate for continuing education. I will put a link in the chat box to make payment for the certificate if you have not done so already. Uh, you will receive, receive a certificate for completion for your CEU by Friday. We will submit the CEUs to the licensing agency tomorrow to make sure if you want the CEU, um, so that, make sure to make payment if you want the CEU by the end of the day. This is part of a monthly webinar series held on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Our next webinar is Pruning uh, and Young Tree Training by Dr. Andrew, Cro Andrew Crozier. Uh, your microphones have been muted. Please put your questions into the chat box and we will take them at the end of the presentation. Also, you will see a survey invitation pop up. Please take a moment to fill this out as it really helps us determine what educational programs to offer. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Tom Wickman to introduce today's speaker, but please be aware that he's working remotely and you might see him glitch every once in a while. So with that, Tom, please take it away. Great, thank you, Jen, um, and welcome everybody. We're glad uh, so many folks are joining us for this month's uh, webinar. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce so our speaker, uh, Dr. Adam Dale. He's an assistant professor in the area of turf grass and ornamental entomology. He is responsible for researching economically important pests of turf grass and ornamental plants and disseminating the results through management recommendations to extension faculty across the state. Florida has the largest turf grass and second largest ornamental industries in the US. As a major port of entry with a tropical and subtropical climate, native and exotic arthropods are constantly creating challenges for these industries. His extension program provides research-based information to turf and ornamental producers and managers on how to effectively and sustainably manage arthropods in these systems. Today, Dr. Dale is presenting an update on new landscape pests and their management. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Adam Dale. Thank you, Tom. Good morning, everyone. Certainly. Uh, I appreciate you having me this morning, and I look forward to sharing some new information with everybody. Um, so rather than really digging into a lot of the, the management strategies and tools and specific management of different pests, this morning more so what I'm going to talk about is new pests or ones that have been around, but we're starting to see some new uh, more frequent issues with, um, as well as some more obscure pests that we just need to keep on our radar. So one thing that I do wanna start with is just setting the context for the system that we're talking about and the system that we all work in. Um, so we know that all these landscapes that we manage are surrounded by people. Uh, people live in urban and residential areas, and turf and ornamental plants are the plants of those spaces. Uh, and a lot of times, Florida is, well, not a lot of times, all the time, Florida is a hot spot for exotic plant and insect invasions. And it's important to think about why that is. So one, we're a major point of entry for the United States. So we've got over 20 ports of entry by uh, land, air, and sea. Um, we also produce a lot of plants um, and receive a lot of plant material. So over 85% of the plants that come into the U.S. go through the Port of Miami and then make their way throughout a large part of the United States. And just due to this simple magnitude of that, we're only able to inspect a very, very small percentage of that. So it's just... Uh, bound to have different insects, different organisms come in undetected. And in addition to having the biggest turf industry in the country and the second largest ornamental and landscape industry in the country, 
we have a major tourist industry. So I'm sure nobody uh, is surprised to hear that we have over 50 million people visit the state every year. And so all of those things combined with our nice, hot, humid climate and all the plants that are in Florida, we get about seven new uh, arthropod species introduced and established every year. Not all those are problem, but some of them are. So this map here uh, shows um, the, the different types of insects and arthropods that live in states in the United States. And each color indicates similar communities. So for example, Alabama, Georgia, and the Carolinas all have a fairly similar uh, group of pest insects that occur in those spaces. You might think that the Southeast is a pretty good category that is all very similar to each other. But if you look at Florida, you see Florida is a unique color amongst all the other Southeastern states. And that's because we are such a hotspot for exotic introductions. So Florida is unique among all states in the United States in terms of the number and different types of exotic pests that live in the state. So we're special. So it's important to, to think about some definitions when you're thinking about different pests, different organisms that occur in these landscapes uh, and make sure you're tracking the right terms. So first, what is an invasive species? So this is a, 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 any organism that is not native to an area, was introduced by people either on purpose or accidentally, and whose introduction causes economic, health-related, or environmental harm. So not all non-native species are invasive because we have all sorts of non-native species that are actually really beneficial to us, like the honeybee, for example and a lot of agricultural crops. So that's non-native and invasive. Now, what about plant pests? I'm sure everyone feels confident that they can define a plant pest. And so these things are any organisms whose activity, whether that's feeding or some component of their behavior, reduces the health and or reproductive potential of a plant. And so when I say reproductive potential, that means their ability to flower, their ability to produce seeds, and their ability to uh, sustain life. So we have all sorts of plant pests. I'm sure aphids are familiar, like these on the bottom right. Um, scale insects, like the ones here on the bottom left. White flies, army worms. I'm sure many of you could list off uh, several different plant pests. So. That's plant pests. Now I'm gonna kind of throw a little bit of nuance into here and talk about insects that feed on plants. So it's important to remember that 100% of insect plant pests are plant feeders, but 99% of plant feeders are not plant pests. So there's only a really tiny subset of in plant feeding insects that are actually falling within this pest category. Um, and that is because these small subset of insects respond to some type of disturbance that allows them to proliferate and become problematic. So really in the landscape, there's all sorts of stuff out there eating plants and that's good because that helps support our ecosystems and food webs and helps support all the things that we depend on from plants and insects. Uh, but the small subset of ones that you are familiar with because you've got to manage them are really a tiny percentage. And those things are responding to things like changes in a plant's ability to defend itself because the plant is stressed, for example. Um, it's responding to a lack of predatory or parasitic organisms that, have, that can come in and help regulate those populations or they're responding to an enhanced ability to colonize an area or um, an enhanced ability to reproduce. And unfortunately for us, a lot of those conditions are commonplace in urban and residential areas. And that's because we've created these spaces. They're very disturbed habitats by definition. 
So if you think about uh, a, I'm sure many of you have seen a white fly infestation um, on a landscape plant or a scale insect infestation on a landscape plant. Um, I bet 100% of those encounters have been in urban and residential landscapes and 0% of those have been in forests or other natural habitats. And that's because in these natural habitats, plants and insects, they all regulate themselves. So you've got those herbivores present, but they haven't become pests. And the, the way that non-native herbivores fall into this is because a lot of times the pests are non-native herbivores that have become invasive because they come into this new habitat, they're able to overcome the, the defenses of native plants. They don't have any natural predators or parasites because they've come into a new, onto a new continent where predators and parasites have never seen them before. Um, so they kind of have free reign. And this is really important and relevant to us in Florida because we've got a lot of invasive plant or spear pests. Uh, and all, a lot of the uh, most apparent damage and occurrence of these happen where people live. So they're very high visibility um, and their impacts to plants directly affect people. So 90% of people in Florida live in urban and residential landscapes, the spaces that we serve and the plants that we manage. Um, the plants in these spaces provide a lot of value, whether it's mental well-being, uh, environmental health, and supporting life in urban landscapes where you've got a lot of pavement. Um, and when pests come in and damage that, we're going to suffer. This is in, even more important moving forward because over the next 50 years or so, these spaces are only going to get bigger, more widespread, and our jobs as managers of these plant systems are only going to be more demanded because there's going to be a lot more land area dedicated to this space where people are living. And we're going to still need plants. So I was trying to think of, or I was trying to find an image of a very uh, typical residential landscape, just to get a picture of the plants that we deal with. And so here's kind of your, your characteristic residential landscape. You've got turf grass, you've got uh, ornamental plants in these beds, flower beds, and then you've got trees in these landscapes. So you've got kind of these three layers of vegetation. And each layer is going to have its own unique issues and need to be managed in its own ways. Um, but this is the vegetation that we manage. And I didn't realize how much text I put on this slide. But so this is a, just a little screenshot of a magazine article I wrote for Pest Pro magazine a year or two ago. Um, and it's all about how the origin of plants and landscapes affects what insects feed on them. And so I encourage you every time you're on a property, one thing I always try to encourage folks is to be able to identify the plants that you're managing. As we'll talk about later, one major reason for that is that a lot of insect pests are very specialized to their host plants. Um, so if you know what host plant you're dealing with, you're gonna have a very, a, a much better ability to shorten the list of potential pests that are causing that problem. And then you'll be able to manage them much more effectively. The other way that plant uh, identification comes in handy is that um, native and exotic plants tend to have different uh, abilities to support herbivores or different susceptibilities to insect pests. So, if you think about the most common plants in the landscapes that you manage, if you're in North Florida, maybe that's uh, azaleas or camellias, um, ligustrum, all three of those plants are not native to, the, to North America, but they're, one, they're the, about the three most common plants in the landscape. Now think about what pests you see on those plants. So azaleas, you see azalea lace bugs all the time. 
also not native. They came from the place where the azaleas came from. Camellias get attacked by T-scale, also originated in Asia where camellias came from. So being able to link that plant origin um, to the pests that get on those plants can give you a better ability to predict pest susceptibility. So I always, always encourage people to identify the plants and think about if they're native or not. This isn't to say native plants are always better choice than non-native plants, um, but it is to say you've always got to tailor plant selection to the landscape. And at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll share this webpage URL again, but uh, this article and a lot of the other ones that I'm gonna reference throughout this presentation are at my lab's website, which is the link at the bottom left. So if we think about invasive insect pests in our landscapes, we could create, I could have multiple slides uh, dedicated to just listing off these organisms. Um, but these are some of the ones that came to mind first. And I'm sure some of these uh, are familiar to you. They are names that you recognize. Uh, maybe some, maybe chili thrips or maybe red imported fire ants. Maybe the phantasma scale has been causing some issues for some of you recently. Uh, I bet if you've ever dealt with sagos, Asian cycad scale is a familiar pest. All of these insects did not originate in North America and they have come from various regions in the world because of trade and the movement of people and plants like I was talking about earlier. And so everything that I'm gonna talk about uh, as we go through various uh, pests that you should have on your radar is gonna be in the context of integrated pest management and kind of thinking about uh, these five different steps of IPM. I'm not going to walk through each step on every case, but it's always important to think about those as you're going through different pest scenarios. The most important one is up front is identification. If you don't know what you're dealing with, you're going to have a pretty difficult time effectively managing it. So identification is critical and IFAS has tons of resources that are solely dedicated to helping you identify and diagnose pest problems. So there's all sorts of web-based uh, fact sheets and documents that have information to help you out. There's also diagnostic labs located throughout the state that are here to serve your needs. Um, so if, if you don't, don't get overwhelmed with all these URLs, just look at the bottom one. The very bottom one is the UFIFIS Diagnostic Hub. That's the one go to that webpage and it'll take you to uh, one centralized location where you can then find diagnostic resources and services. So please utilize those uh, because they are here specifically for you. So now we're gonna dig into a little, uh, a little more into specific pests that you need to keep on your radar uh, in the landscape. So as I talk about these, I want you to, make note of them and really when you go out to a property and you're managing maybe you're just doing a site visit or a service visit and it's pretty routine always have your eyes peeled for new signs and symptoms of anything um, especially these things that i'm going to mention here and that's because there's always new stuff in florida you should never be surprised to find something new And here are just a few snippets of some of the things that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, maybe some look familiar, maybe others look pretty bizarre. Hopefully a little bit of both. So the first one I'm gonna mention is one that has been on our radar for a couple of years now. Uh, and it's something that we've been talking about for the past probably three to four years. Um, but last year it was finally detected in Florida. So we've been saying for so long, watch out for this. It's probably gonna show up soon. And now it has. So this is something that you need to keep on your radar, especially if you are anywhere in the panhandle part of the state. Uh, so this is the crepe myrtle bark scale. I bet you can guess which plant it affects. Uh, 
remember, always identify your host plant and that'll narrow the list of potential culprits. So the crepe myrtle bark scale attacks crepe myrtles and crepe myrtles are the number one most common tree slash shrub in urban landscapes throughout the southeastern United States. So pretty much from Texas to Florida to Virginia, these things are a dominant plant in the landscape. So just like with turf grass, uh, when we talk about something like chinch bugs, crepe myrtles uh, are plentiful and crepe myrtle bark scale has plenty of food. So right now, this is a fairly recent distribution map of crepe myrtle bark scale. Um, I couldn't find a very, the most, I don't think that the, it's been updated since the detection in Florida, uh, but now this does have an established population here over in the, the Western part of the state up in the panhandle. Um, so this is a, uh, called a felt scale. So it looks kind of like a mealybug, got a lot of white waxy stuff on it, um, but it is a scale insect. It's native to China and it is now fairly widely established throughout the Southeastern United States. Started in Texas and has worked its way east and north. Um, so this thing uh, is a soft scale. So one important thing for you to be able to do is distinguish between soft scales and armored scales um, because they cause different signs and symptoms and uh, management differs a bit between the two. So soft scales, you're gonna see branch die back in the trees. You're gonna see leaves dropping before they should, maybe turning yellow and falling off. Um, and you're gonna see a lot of honeydew production. So in this uh, photo here on the top right, these are a bunch of tulip tree scales, which are also another soft scale species. But you see that uh, looks like water droplets coming off of these, these bugs but that's just sugary poop. And so that sugary poop drops down on leaf surfaces beneath where the scales are feeding, covers those things, and then this black sooty mold fungus grows on those leaves. So you're gonna see a lot of honeydew and sooty mold growth associated with soft scales. Remember that, soft scales, sooty mold. So crepe myrtle bark scale are a good example of uh, pretty prolific honeydew producers. So these things are feeding away on these plants and pooping as much as possible. So you get crepe myrtles that are pretty well coated in uh, honeydew and sooty mold. So this crepe myrtle is fairly black because it's covered in sooty mold. And then you see some of these white waxy individuals. Uh, so some things to look out for is that Crepe myrtle bark scale preferentially feeds in the crotches of branches or at pruning cuts. So if you are managing any crepe myrtles and you see any sooty mold on these plants, look at where, or where uh, branches separate or at any places where pruning cuts have been made. And as you know, a lot of people love to prune crepe myrtles. So in many cases, there's no shortage of fresh pruning wounds for these things to establish. One other reason, yet another reason why uh, you should be moderate on how heavily you're pruning crepe myrtles. So I was given a presentation in Columbia, South Carolina for a big pest uh, control event. Um, and I was talking about this pest, crepe myrtle bark scale. Nobody really seemed to have ever seen it. Um, and it was fairly new a new thing for people to learn about. Um, so I assumed it wasn't in the area yet, but then I walked outside of the convention center and I saw all these black crepe myrtles all over the place. And it, when I took a closer look, there are crepe myrtle bark scales feeding. Here you see at the top right, here's a pruning cut where someone cut a branch off and you've got crepe myrtle bark scale feeding in that area. And here, this little depression where the branch separates from the main trunk, you've also got crepe myrtle bark scale. So keep an eye out for this. Uh, it's fairly easy to find when you have infestations. Um, so if you're managing crepe myrtles, this is something to look for.
this is the only bark scale or mealy bug looking insect that feeds on crepe myrtles in the United States. So uh, you're unlikely to find anything that looks like this on a crepe myrtle. You might see honeydew on crepe myrtles because there are uh, crepe myrtle aphids that are very common on crepe myrtle leaves. And they also produce a lot of honeydew and you'll see black sooty mold growth. But those are pretty distinguishable. They don't look anything like crepe myrtle bark scale and they're gonna primarily be on the leaves. Uh, another thing about scale insects that's really important is making sure they're alive. So when scale insects die, they don't fall off the plant. And a lot of times it looks like you have a very heavy infestation when in fact they're all dead. It's just an old leftover infestation. Uh, so the best thing to do with any scale insects, especially crepe myrtle bark scale, is smash them and see if they juice. So these things produce nice purple juice when they get crushed. And if they do explode with purple, purple juice, that means you have a live active infestation. So again, as the name indicates, crepe myrtles are the plant that these things feed on, but importantly, they also feed on American beautyberry. So uh, American beautyberry is a fairly common uh, native ornamental plant that occurs throughout Florida. Uh, and these things have been found feeding on this as well. <clears throat> Thinking back to uh, what I was talking about earlier with plant origin, crepe myrtles are native to Asia, crepe myrtle bark scale also native to Asia, uh, but here we have um, these scale insects jumping over to a native plant. So it's not always that you have exotic plants associated with invasive pests, um, but a lot of times it is. So here again, these uh, crepe myrtles have been very heavily pruned. So plenty of feeding sites for these crepe myrtle bark scales. And you have very black sooty mold covered crepe myrtles. So we know these things are in the panhandle of Florida now. Uh, please keep an eye out for these. If you do find it on crepe myrtles, please report it. Send a message to me, contact your local extension agent, contact uh, FDAX, and let somebody know because these are an invasive regulatory pest that can cause a lot of issues. So don't simply manage it like any other scale insect that you might find in the landscape. That being said, once it is established in an area, uh, it does need to be managed similar to scale, other scale insect pests. Um, and people have been working on various ways to control these insects. They've tried things like pressure washing uh, tree trunks, trying to just wash them off of plants. That doesn't work very well. Um, these things do get eaten by ladybugs. So uh, there was a study at the University of Auburn that showed that if you uh, put these big yellow cards in trees, it would attract lady beetles to those trees. And then um, you'd get up to 75% control uh, of these scale insects just simply from the ladybugs eating them. But you've got to put these big yellow cards in the trees to attract them. And then, so uh, like we see with a lot of other scale insects, kind of our industry standard products for scale insect management seem to be the most effective. So uh, systemic insecticides like safari, uh, translaminar insect growth regulators like talus and distance, those products seem to provide pretty good control, but you've got to be persistent and stay on top of things. So that's crepe myrtle bark scale. The next thing we're going to talk about is another scale insect. Um, and it's not this one, but the reason I have this one on here is because this is a familiar pest to a lot of people who have ever managed camellias. Uh, so T scale is a very common insect pest of camellias. It's kind of hard to find a camellia in a landscape that doesn't have T scale on it. And these are an armored scale. Uh, that causes this yellow discoloration on the leaves. And you flip that leaf over and there are scale insects all over the place on the underside of that. Again, camellias native to Asia, T-scale native to Asia. 
So the genus of this scale insect is Fiorinia. And there's another Fiorinia pest that's been causing a lot of issues in South Florida. And that is called Phantasma scale. So this scale insect looks very similar to T scale, just a slightly different species. And it uh, is also an armored scale. So these things are not feeding on camellias, they're feeding on palms instead. And I believe uh, they've started to find these infestate or this scale insect infesting other plants um, in the landscape near those infestations on palms. Um, so there's a pretty active research projects going on with this pest. Uh, Dr. Lance Osborne uh, with IFAS down in Orlando and Z Ahmed with the USDA are doing several trials on this insect. So these are some close-up images. Uh, these two on the right are the adult females, and then these little white waxy ones are the males. So this is very characteristic of armored scales, especially in this genus. So if you find these white waxy, uh, kind of small white waxy individuals, those are typically the males, and then the oyster shell looking ones are the females. So again, remember the difference between soft scales and armored scales. So armored scales, the biggest difference is armored scales do not produce sooty mold or do not produce honeydew. So you don't see any sooty mold associated with armored scale infestations. So uh, when soft scales poop, they just are pumping out that sugary water. Armored scales feed on a different part within the plant and so when they poop, they just make their armored covering out of it. Um, so you don't see sooty mold, but you do see tree canopy dieback, branch dieback, lots of leaf yellowing, premature leaf drop, um, and like kind of a slow death of the plant. So this is very, very typical of what we see on palms infested with phantasma scale. Um, but they're going to be all in the fronds, so you'll see like in these photos, all these palm fronds are very heavily infested with phantasma scale. You see all the white waxy buildup, which is the males. And then if you look closer, you'll see the females uh, that are the brown, brownish oyster shell looking individuals. Here's another close up for you just to get a better idea of what this looks like. Um, so this is something to look out for in southeastern Florida. This is primarily attacking palms um, and primarily the Canary Island date palms, which as you know, are not cheap plants. So these things uh, need to be fairly aggressively managed once they're detected. Um, this is a worldwide uh, insect pest and it's been known to attack a bunch of other plants. So it's not specialized to palms, that's just the primary host plant that it's been attacking in Florida. Uh, I believe they have an updated list that they're, they're continuously updating with new host plants that they detect that on. And I'll show you, I'll give you a link to that here in a second. So again, do you see sooty mold associated with phantasma scale? No, you do not. So you can't rely on that. You gotta look for the yellow chlorotic uh, spots on the leaves. Another really big challenge here is that typically these palms are not small plants. So it's not easy to see little yellow chlorotic spots on a palm frond 15, 20 feet above you um, until you have pretty widespread damage. So um, it's tricky, but you gotta do what you can to try to detect these infestations. Maybe you're walking around the plants looking at them with binoculars. I don't know, you gotta do what works best for you. So right now, these things have only been uh, reported to be established in Miami-Dade and Palm Beach counties. Again, you've got to keep these things on our radar so that we can keep an active uh, record of where they're occurring in the state because we need to know where they are so we can manage them um, and know the relative risk associated with them. Um, in areas where they are established, uh, you've, all, you've got to continue management like you do with armored scales. So 
One of the biggest management differences with armored scales compared to soft scales is that you can't control armored scales with the metacloprid. So a metacloprid um, like Merit uh, or uh, Marathon or a lot of other different types of product names, trade names, that's typically our go-to uh, systemic insecticide because it's dirt cheap and it works pretty well. Um, but for armored scales, you cannot use a metacloprid because it's not gonna do any good for you. Um, they have been evaluating a lot of different things. Um, they've found several products that seem to work pretty well. Again, they're kind of your standard armored scale insecticides like Safari, uh, but there are several newer chemistries out there that seem to work pretty well on armored scales. So products like Ventigra that I'll mention later, uh, we seem to see some pretty good armored scale efficacy from those. So th this is the website that I mentioned. Um, this is the Mid Florida Research and Education Center down in Apopka. Um, and Dr. Lance Osborne is doing a good bit of work on Phantasma scale, trying to figure out how to best manage it and how to keep it from spreading too much throughout the state. So I encourage you to check that out. I and mean, there's all sorts of resources like insecticides that they have found that work, host plants, biology, all sorts of stuff. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is a bit of a different issue. It's another thing that we've been dealing with in the landscape on woody plants, uh, but it is not associated with a scale insect. Um, so these thing, each of these images is from a different landscape, different host plant species, uh, and a completely different scenario in every case. But the damage all looks fairly similar. And so this has been a puzzle that we've been trying to figure out for the past few years and really get to the bottom of what's going on. Um, so you'll see, well, before I dig into this, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. So one potential culprit associated with these uh, different types of plant damage are called eriophyid mites. So these are little tiny, almost microscopic, banana shaped mites that are highly specialized on their host plants. And they're typically known as gall mites or bud mites uh, because they cause really weird growths on plants. So whenever they feed on plants, they, uh, they inject plant growth regulators with their saliva. And that causes these plants to develop into weird shapes and create habitat for these things to live and feed. Um, but a very important trait of eriophyid mites is that nearly every one of them, every one of the species that we know about feed only on one type of plant. So one genus of plant or even one species of plant. So eriophyid mite uh, infestations typically uh, result in deformed uh, modified plant growth. Um, and that's because where they feed and what they inject when they feed. And so all of this growth is gonna occur on new tissue. That's an important thing to look at when you're looking at these plants. If you see a plant that has this galling infestation, the damage from a mite is gonna be on new growth, newly expanding leaves, newly expanding flowers, et cetera. And these things look all sorts of different shapes, colors, sizes. Some of them are pretty cool looking like this, uh, maple leaf down here on the bottom left. So the, some of them are kind of funky looking like you would uh, have a new plant cultivar that has these crazy colors and shapes. Um, and in most cases, they don't cause damage. They cause this aesthetic growth and deformity and kind of make the plant look weird, but they don't kill the plant or really cause any reduction in the plant's vigor, but not all the time. So. There's always exceptions. Um, for example, this is a, uh, an eriophyid mite that attacks lantana and it causes these really tight growths and distortions on lantana. And it has actually been used as a biological control organism in some parts of the world to control lantana because some lantana is, or is invasive um, and these mites can help regulate its populations. 
I have seen this uh, infesting lantana in Florida. So if you see lantana that has these really crazy growths on it, a lot of times that can be linked to these mites. So again, these mites typically don't harm the plant, although sometimes they can. In most cases, you can prune out the damage and the plant will recover or the new growth will look normal. Um, in some cases, you need to pair that with a miticide application, um, but you need to make sure that that miticide is labeled for eriophyid mites. Um, and we've got some information on my webpage and through IFAS on effective uh, miticides for eriophyid mites. Um, and I have given presentations various other occasions on managing ereophytes. So look at the label and make sure you've got ereophytes on the label and not just spider mites. And then always keep in mind using things that are not miticides. So generally miticides control mites, insecticides control insects. Some insecticides have mites on the label, but just because it's on the label does not mean it's gonna be the best thing for you to use. So I always say, I always recommend miticides when you have mite infestations. So I all this talk about mites because mites can be the issue in some cases, but in many cases, we have also found that mites have nothing to do with the damage that we're seeing on these plants. And in those cases, a lot of times it's associated with herbicide damage. Specifically, uh, herbicides in the imidazolinone class of herbicides. So these are things like amazepic, amaziquin, amazapir, all the amazas. Um, they can cause this deformed growth on new expanding plant tissue on woody plants. And so these herbicides, when you apply them to the soil, they, they remain in the soil where they're readily picked up by plant roots for six months to a year after they've been applied to the soil. And so you can see damage to newly planted vegetation um, or even established vegetation for very extended periods after that product was applied, which is very important to keep in mind. And it's also why it's very important to keep uh, detailed records over long periods of time of what products are used in the landscape. So we've been dealing with this for the past few years in Florida um, and trying to get to the bottom of what the primary cause of these of this disformed plant growth is. And so we've seen we, I've, I've received all sorts of samples from all over the state and inspected those plants for mites, uh, tried to figure out what we can link to the damage. But only about 40% of the infested symptomatic plant tissue has had mites on it. And presence does not indicate causation. Um, and in addition, four out of five plant samples that we submit for uh, detection of herbicide exposure has come back positive for exposure to imazapir. Um, so in a lot of cases, it seems like it's, it's herbicide damage and not mite damage. Um, to, to really dig into this a little deeper, we collected a bunch of uh, mite infested ligustrum plants and collected those mites off of the ligustrum and then infested healthy uh, asymptomatic ligustrum plants to see if we can induce this damage on the new plants. And unfortunately, we found no effect of these mites on the plants. So it seems like there's some factor either in addition to the mites or separate from the mites that is causing this, this damage on the gustrum. Um, so here's a, an EDIS document that we put out last year about this issue on how to diagnose this, how to diagnose it, what to do about it, and potential causes. Um, and it goes into how to submit samples, how to collect plant material, how to evaluate things. So I'm not gonna dig too deep into this. One thing I will say is that if you are curious if your plant has been exposed to one of these herbicides, uh, I don't think any IFAS labs offer this service. Um, so you've got to submit that plant material to a specialized lab that can evaluate it for herbicide exposure. 
So some things to think about, things to consider if you have plants that have this galling damage. So first, if several different plant species in the same landscape are showing the same type of galling damage, it's probably not mites and it's probably not even a disease because mites and diseases are very specific about what type of plants they're gonna attack. So remember, these mites are very specialized on their host plants. Um, for example, ligustrum gets infested by, ligust by, by a, an areophyte mite that only feeds on ligustrum. Its species name is Acerai ligustri because it only feeds on ligustrum. So if you see this damage on multiple plant species, it's something other than mites. And in a lot of cases, it turns out that it is herbicide exposure. Sometimes we don't find either associated with them. So it still winds up being a mystery, but it's important to really rule out herbicides and mites before you conclude that it is one of those. So for this reason, you got to keep really, really good records um, of any products that are applied to that site. And you've always got to follow the label on those herbicides because they offer guidance on when, where, and how to apply these materials so that you don't wind up causing all your plants to look like this. So here's our, our, a few different scenarios, a few things that we suspected could have been mites, could have been herbicides, could have been some mystery. Um, and in these cases, these are what we found to be the, the cause of the problem. So on this oleander plant here on the top left, this was herbicide damage from an herbicide containing a mazapir. On the top right, I believe this was a green buttonwood tree in Fort Lauderdale, herbicide damage with a mazapir. On the bottom left, we have uh, an ereophyte ir mite infestation on lantana. One reason we know that is because we know the host plant is lantana, and we know that there's an ereophyte mite that attacks lantana but we also confirmed it by finding the mites. Here in the middle, we have Bermuda grass showing the same symptom. This is called the Bermuda grass mite and we find mites on that. And then here on the bottom right, we have an ash tree with this galling damage also infested with ereophyid mites. But we know that there is an ereophyid mite that specializes on ash trees. So this is a complex situation, but it's important to really uh, rule out potential causes before making a conclusion and managing for a specific cause, because you might be wasting time and money. So the last little bit here, we're gonna talk about some, we're gonna transition away from woody plants and talk about some uh, issues with insect pests in turf grass and lawns. So here's a couple images that I received over the past couple of years. We've got Bermuda grass here on the left, zoysia grass here on the right. Both have chlorotic plant tissue that's dying back. And when you dig around in that tissue, you find these gigantic chinch bugs. Uh, they're not really gigantic, but they do look just like the chinch bugs that we find in St. Augustine grass. And that's because they are the same chinch bugs that we find in St. Augustine grass. So it's important to remember, I hope all of you can just keep in mind that just because you're managing a turf grass type that's not St. Augustine grass does not mean you're not gonna have chinch bugs and that you don't need to look out for chinch bugs as a potential pest of these plants. So if you manage lawns, chinch bugs are no stranger. You're gonna find a mix of life stages from first instar nymphs to a, the black and white adults. These things are sap feeding insects, just like scale insects. Uh, so they cause yellow, yellowing plant material that pretty rapidly turns brown and dies. And they like it hot and dry. If you think about host plants again, so again, when you're talking about plant pests, it almost always comes back to the host plant. So know what type of turf grass you're managing and then know the relative susceptibility of that turf grass to the potential culprit pests that cause issues in turf. 
So in this table, we see St. Augustine grass is the most susceptible preferred host of chinch bugs. And then as you work your way down this table, you come to centipede grass, which is not a host. So if you manage any centipede grass lawns, you're not finding southern chinch bugs in these plants because they're not a host. So this was another article I wrote in Pest Pro a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, 2020, which man, a couple of years ago, that's flown by. Um, so always keep this in mind. Chinch bugs are not specialists on St. Augustine grass. So we know these things can rapidly, rapidly grow up because they produce a lot of babies and those babies develop really quickly. Um, be mindful of the nitrogen going out because nitrogen is fuel for, for insects. So the more nitrogen insects get, the more rapidly they develop, the more eggs they produce. Um, so you got to be mindful and moderate in your nitrogen inputs. Um, and then managing the plants as best as you can. The one thing I will mention is that insecticide resistance is real and documented in chinch bugs throughout a lot of the state to pretty much every chemical class that we use. So please don't apply a pyrethroid to a lawn, to the same lawn every time you treat that lawn, because you're going to fairly quickly select for chinch bugs that can be exposed to pyrethroids and laugh at it. So please rotate insecticides by chemical class and mode of action rather than trade name. Here's one other pest that I'll mention in turf grass systems that's been causing a lot of issues. Another sap feeder, very similar to scale insects, but it's a mealybug. So this is Tuttle mealybug. This has been causing issues all over the state and 98% of the time it's in zoysia grass. So if you manage any zoysia grass, keep an eye out for these. These are pink mealybugs. They look like mealybugs you'd find on an ornamental plant. They produce a lot of white wax and they hang out at the base of the leaf. So here's another image zoomed out a little of a, <clears throat> of a zoysia grass leaf. So you see these pink mealies on the base, all the white waxy residue that they leave behind. Um, if you see declining zoysia grass, this is something you gotta inspect for. The underlying issue with uh, Tuttle mealybug is thatch and a lack of thatch management in zoysia grass. So zoysia produces a lot of thatch and is really prone to an over accumulation of thatch. So when you get too much thatch, you hold too much moisture and you get fungal issues, but you also create a nice little habitat for things like mealybugs to hang out in and thrive. So you've got a verticut or dethatched lawns annually or every couple of years, and that's going to reduce the likelihood of having a total mealybug infestation. And if you have an infestation and you dethatch, it's going to increase how well you control these bugs exponentially. So minimizing habitat is priority number one, which is the thatch management. Um, getting enough material, getting enough liquid volume into the lawn if you have an active infestation is really important. And then patience is really key. So if you wind up having a lawn that looks like the image that I sent, that I showed you initially, that lawn is damaged and it's gonna take some time to recover. So you may make an insecticide application to that lawn and control the mealybugs. You may kill 95% of those mealybugs but that turf isn't going to recover and look like a healthy green zoysia grass lawn when you kill the mealybugs. It's going to take several weeks for that lawn to recover. So don't get in a situation where you treat the lawn, you come back two weeks later and you see no plant recovery. So you treat the lawn again and then you come back two weeks later and you still don't see the turf dense and green. So you treat the lawn again. Look for the bugs, look for the live bugs. Inspect your plant material for the live, pink, juicy, moving mealy bugs. And if you do still have juicy mealy bugs, then you might need to treat it again. But if not, the turf just needs to be babied so that it can recover. 
Otherwise, you're wasting product, wasting time, wasting money, and going to be causing other issues because you're applying these insecticides that are killing other things in most cases. So some other things that we're seeing uh, seemingly increasingly frequently in turf are other obscure turf pests like scale insects. So here's an image here on the right of a sugarcane scale infestation in centipede grass. So this is a photo I took last week. Um, and these are scale insects that are feeding on the stolons and leaves of centipede grass and causing some yellow chlor chlorotic damage and decline. Uh, Bermuda grass scale is a very similar insect that attacks Bermuda grass. Um, and Rhodes grass mealybug is another mealybug that causes kind of a general decline in multiple turf types. So I tell you about these because these are very difficult to detect insect pests and they cause damage that looks very similar to drought stress or kind of a, a general decline in turf health. Um, but there are these little insect pests hanging out, feeding on the plant. And a lot of times they're responding to disturbance, like I said in the beginning. So uh, scale insects in particular really uh, do best in droughty, hot conditions, kind of like we've been having and throughout North Florida for the past several months. Um, so these are the types of conditions that they thrive in. But the only way you're gonna find these bugs is taking a plant sample and looking at it under a microscope or utilizing the diagnostic labs that IFAS has at your disposal. So there is, a, there is an EDIS document about managing scale insects and turf. So I encourage you to check this out just so these things are on your radar uh, because they will catch you off guard and you wanna be looking for these things. So when you're in a lawn, inspect that plant material and see what you find. If you see some decline, take a sample, send it to a diagnostic lab. Um, then you'll have your answers and you'll know what you need to manage for. So I've talked about a bunch of pests, but do you notice any trends? Are there any particular insect groups that seem to be uh, more common? And I would say, yes, they're scale insects. So scale insects and mealybugs are textbooks, exploiters of disturbance. So these things are all over the place causing issues in urban and residential landscapes. And part of the reason is because they're very intimately associated with their habitats and they respond, um, they respond to any kind of disturbance because they're linked to their host plant. So any kind of plant stress is gonna trigger responses. And I know I'm almost out of time, but one final thing that I'll touch on is that I encourage you to explore new insecticides, get outside of your comfort zone, try to use some of the new chemistries that are out there uh, that are more compatible with IPM. And by more compatible, I mean that they allow predators and parasitoids and natural regulations of pest populations to happen while you're also getting that direct chemical toxicity of your pests. So don't assume the cheapest and most readily available products are the most IPM compatible. They're generally not. Um, and a lot of the things that we've relied on for the past several years, like our neonicotinoids, tend to be the most effective option or historically most effective. Uh, but we're seeing more and more issues associated with lack of control or unintended consequences on other organisms. Um, so get out of your comfort zone and explore new chemistries. Look at the soft products like soaps and oils. We've got EDIS documents on those. In many cases, those can handle small pest outbreaks. Also look at other older chemistries like insect growth regulators that are very targeted at the plant pests. And look at newer chemistries. So a lot of the big chemical companies are pushing out a lot of new um, a lot of new products that are reduced risk, they are more compatible with integrated pest management, and they work very well at targeting specific pest groups. So uh, products like Altus, 
control sap feeding pests like aphids and soft scales very well. And they don't have pollinator protection. It doesn't have a pollinator protection labeling like our other neonicotinoids do. Uh, other products like Ventigra provide very good control of armored scales, uh, but are also more selective for those pests. So explore those. Remember that IPM is managing the system, not just managing one individual piece of the system. You've got to think things through and evaluate your situation. And you got to always be very observant uh, because there's always something new to look out for. So effective pest management requires effective pest detection and effective plant management. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, and thank you for your attention and your time. Adam, thank you so very much. Uh, you covered uh, a lot of uh, a lot of ground in that uh, last hour, and you know you've given us a lot to think about. Um, I do have a few questions that uh, have come up. Um, start back with this. We'll go back to early on. What is uh, a regulatory pest? How would you how would you define that? So a regulatory pest, that's a good question. A regulatory pest is a pest that uh, the Florida Department of Agriculture and or the USDA uh, are concerned about because their establishment and spread in the US presents uh, economic risks and, and or human health risks or environmental risks to, to the US. Okay, great. Um, can you explain a little bit more about the use of the yellow cards uh, used to attract mealybugs or ladybugs, excuse me? Yeah, so that was kind of an interesting study uh, at Auburn. So what they did is they hung yellow cards. They're bigger than like index cards. They're like a sheet of paper size, um, but they're kind of stiff yellow cards. They just stick them in the canopy of uh, crepe myrtle trees and insects are attracted to yellow. So lady beetles are one of those insects. And so when they hung those in the trees, they saw that a lot of lady beetles were attracted to those trees established in them and then fed on the mealy bug or fed on the bark scales that were infesting them. Okay, uh, very cool. And you know, another way of um, helping to protect plants, I guess, uh, you know, without any pesticides. Um, do aerified mites cause dieback in, in plants? Uh, so they can. So aerified mites are really, uh, they're a difficult nut to crack, but um, in some cases they can cause dieback, but that dieback is always going to look like uh, very distorted, uh, stunted growth. Um, so they're not going to just cause a general decline in that plant the new tissue is not going to expand and it's going to be really stunted looking, um, but they don't always, Do you know? Go ahead, it's not Adam, always going to, it's, it's not always going to cause the uh, real damage to the plant. Okay. Um, do you know if they affect podocarpus at all? I can't say I have seen any, uh, any podocarpus that has had ureophyid mites. That's not to say that they, they don't, but I don't think we've gotten any samples from any of Podocarpus. Okay. Um, could herbicide dam damage a 30 year old live oak? And they've got a, a situation where the bark appears to be crumbling off. Hmm. Uh, so I would say yes, herbicides can definitely damage uh, well established mature trees. Um, but I don't know about the bark crumbling off. I can't speak to what that might be caused by. Yeah, it seems like that might be something else. Uh, there, you know, if if there would be herbicide damage, there could also be something else going on as well. Um, yeah. Does uh, in your experience, do you know if uh, Plumeria or Frangipani has problems with scale or mites? Uh, I think I have seen scale insects on frangipani. Yes. 
And yeah, really I bugs, I think. Uh-huh. Okay. And um, someone was asking you to discuss the prevention and management of army worms, if you ha have a minute or two that you can um, talk about army worms. The, all right. Yeah, so, so let's see. It was either 2020 or 2021. We had like an unprecedented uh, level of army worm infestations throughout the United States. Um, and Florida tends to be the source of a lot of those army worm populations. So you can, um, everyone can thank you if you've got people in the North that <laughs> had that issue. Um, so army worms, the, some of the best things that you can do is look for eggs. So army worms lay fairly large egg masses um, and they prefer to lay those eggs on light colored surfaces. So like uh, the gutters or trim on your house um, or on the undersides of leaves that overhang your lawn. So like a, like a big elephant ear leaf, if you flip that leaf over a lot of times, you'll find these egg masses on the bottom of those leaves. So looking for the egg clusters is one thing because then you can just smash those eggs and take out several hundred fall army worms at once. Um, and then looking for early stages of, of feeding damage. So really young caterpillars, they're so tiny that they can't chew through the leaf tissue. So they scrape the leaf surface off. Um, and so looking for that early sign of feeding, which will appear like little windows that have been scraped off of the, the grass leaf tissue. Um, those are the kind of the two biggest things. Sod webworms, you'll see a lot of adult moth activity uh, when you're walking through your yard, but fall armyworms, you don't see as much of the moth activity uh, just because they're going to be flying at night. Okay, terrific. Um, is, to your knowledge, is phantasma scale affecting any native palms? Um, I know you said it's, uh, you know, primarily on on Phoenix and, and Eureka, um, but uh, you know, do you know if it's affecting natives? I, I have not seen any, any record that they've found it on natives yet, but I do know they have found it on several other woody plants uh, in the landscape. I wanna say they have found it on Ligustrum, uh, which is obviously a very common uh, landscape plant throughout Florida. Uh, but I don't, I don't think I've seen any documentation on native palms yet. But they do feed on a wide range of plants. So that's not to say that they can't feed on native palms. All right, Adam, thank you so much for this time. Um, you know, judging by all the comments that I saw, you know, in, in the chat, uh, the information was well received and everybody appreciated all the, the great information. Uh, just as a reminder to all those out there that uh, this webinar will be posted to the Florida Friendly Landscaping website. That's floridafriendlylandscaping.com. Uh, so you'll be able to go back. It may take a week or two to get that, uh, this presentation loaded up, but uh, please go back, rewatch it, um, share it with uh, those, uh, those folks that haven't had a chance to watch it, some of your employees or, uh, or colleagues. Um, and uh, do pay attention uh, on July 12th it will be our next one at 10 o'clock. That's Dr. Andrew Kozer on pruning uh, and training of young trees. So it should be, uh, should be a really interesting one. Adam, thank you once again for, uh, for a great presentation and uh, filling us in on, uh, on what to watch out for. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Okay, everybody have a great day.